Christy Wallace is here to talk about all things Indiana Fever and Australia basketball. Locked on Women's Basketball starts now. Ogumba Wallace for the win. You are Locked on Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Well, hi, everyone, and happy Thursday to you. I'm Howard Magdal, thanking you for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen every single day. Um, you guys keep turning out over 100,000 people listened every single month this WNBA season. We're on path to break that mark with the highest ever here in August. So really appreciate you showing up for us the way we show up for you. And, of course, it is not just me. It is the entire group over at the nexthoops.com where we have somebody covering each of the 12 WNBA teams in market, making sure that there are over a hundred reported pieces every single month on women's basketball. Go subscribe for $9 a month or $72 a year, the nexthoops.com. And somebody we've had the privilege of covering there uh, on the WNBA side and the WNBL side uh, across international play as well is Christy Wallace of the Indiana Fever who joins us. And Christy, you know, there's obviously a lot that happens when you come to a new team, but I had to notice that on your Instagram at the very start of the season, you shouted out a particular member of the Fever, and that is Freddie Fever. If you could take me through a little bit about, you know, that relationship, that working relationship, and how it's gone here so far in your first year of the Fever. Yeah, thank you for having me, Howard. Excited to be here. Um, yeah, uh, I, in terms of the Freddie Fever thing, I think I'm just a big fan um, of Freddie Fever and um, also just really excited to be here in Indiana and just to get amongst uh, the culture, the fans um, and what we do here at the Fever. So um, really excited just, just to come into this group and to get into it straight away. Yeah, no, Fre- Freddie, obviously a critical part of the team. But so have you been, and, you know, arguably more so, no offense to Freddie. But again, like for those listeners who may not know, we're going to talk a lot about in segment one about your impact with the fever and sort of how you have fit in there. But you have overcome, I I believe you had something like four different knee surgeries within three years. You know, I remember having a conversation about you with a college coach years and years ago talking about the fact that we can't wait till she gets to the W, but then there's been this wait, there's been this period of time. And I know when we've talked in the past, you've said, you know, there were moments where you felt like you wondered whether it was ever going to happen for you. Does that feel like part of the distant past now, or is that something that you kind of reflect on on a regular basis even now? Good question. I I do reflect on it quite a bit. Um, And just knowing where I was at, so all the four surgeries were on one of my knees um, and we couldn't quite get it right. And there was just lots of pain and and it was just an ongoing process. So I really, and I had multiple conversations and I really thought that I might have to retire from basketball. I I wasn't sure if my body could handle it. Um, And I was actually the last surgery that I had, I, I kind of made a mental note saying, this is my last go and I'm going to give it everything I've got and try all the little weird rehab things that I can, but I'm going to give it everything, but this will be my last try. Mm-hmm. Um, and to make it on my, you know, last try essentially to, to this point here, is, it's just really special. Um, and, and a real credit to the team that I, that I have in Australia, um, the people that supported me throughout the journey um, it couldn't have happened without them. Mm-hmm. Um, but but now that I am playing and I and I do get to have a spot in the WNBA, it's just such a gift, and it's something I don't take for granted because I know how easily um, opportunities like this can be taken away, um, as it as it happened to me quite some time. So um, very thankful to be here, and 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 something I reflect on quite a bit. And it's delightful to see you're on path, of course to have even more minutes here in year two in Indiana than you did in year one uh, with the Atlanta dream. But excuse me, from the moment you have arrived in Indiana, 
they have looked at you as somebody who they were relying on for space and shooting. And of course, for our listeners who may not know at home, you're a knockdown three point shooter everywhere you've gone. Doesn't matter what continent you're on, the shots fall. And so I just wonder if you could take me through those initial conversations with Lynn Don and then obviously with Christy Sides as well, who you knew, you know, from your time uh, where she was an assistant in Atlanta the previous season. Of course, yeah. So it worked out quite well. Um, Christy got the job uh, in Indiana, and, and at the time I still thought I was playing for Atlanta. But um, when conversations started happening with my agent, um, I, I, I kind of had a chat with Christy, and and we were like talking about it. Is, is this an option? Would, would you would you want to come to Indiana? Um, and just knowing that Christy had the job and was coming here, I, I said yes without a doubt. I, I think that. You know, I trust Christy and I know what she's about and, and who she is as a person. Um, and I know that um, she's got the, the best intentions um, in her heart. So, I, so I, was, I was keen to be a part of the build that she's trying to make here. Um, and already she's, she's done a great job and, and our team's done really well. Um, you know, obviously we have our up and downs, but um, I think she's doing a great job. Absolutely. I, I mean, without question, you're seeing – some significant, particularly in the offensive end, some significant growth yeah. year over year. I was talking to Lexi Hall about this on the podcast earlier this week, but you guys have gone from the team was 12th in offensive efficiency last year in the league, and mm-hmm. uh, you guys are fifth in the league so far this year. Uh, you obviously do a lot of driving the bus when it comes to that. And I, I guess from your perspective, sort of popping off the bench for much of the season, are there ways in which you see the game where you say, all right, I know when I'm getting there, we'll get to your starting, which has happened the last couple of games, but there are specific ways that like, I'm going to impact the game this way tonight because I'm seeing something that we need as opposed to a different way where you're able to do it in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I think that's the kind of, you kind of got to have that mindset um, mm-hmm. when you're coming off the bench. You got to just bring a spark and bring energy and have impact. Uh, especially when you're in that role. And I don't mind that role at all. I, I um, you know, and I, and I didn't actually know whether I'd be coming on for the point guard or the two man or the three man. So um, to be able to play those combo positions um, and just be kind of ready to go, um, you know, is, is, you know, it like, it's just, you got to be mentally ready. And I think that um, I really think that going through all my injury stuff, um, really helped me to stay mentally locked in um, because having that gratitude, you know, just constantly in me, it's just, it's a bit easier to be thrown around and not really sure what position I'm going to be in, but, but know that and be confident that, um, you know, that I can, you know, fill the role or whatever it'll be. Um, but yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm just enjoying a bit playing whatever role I can for this team. And as a point of personal privilege, I need to point out that you may undersell your ability to come off the bench just a little bit. I mean, you are the uh, 2022 WNBL Sixth Woman of the Year. So this is something you've done exceptionally well, of course, uh, you know, both here and uh, over in Australia. So it's worth noting that. It's interesting, though. Do you think that that skill set was in you prior to all the knee injuries? Or do you think that's something that essentially came as a result of that time? You've done your research, Howard. Um, I, I, yeah, I think that's just a part of that mentality. I think whenever you're a role player, um, and especially when you're coming off the bench, you just need to bring something, uh, something different. And whether that's energy, whether that's defensive presence, whether that's sprinting the floor as hard as you can, I, I like to keep it small and controllable. Those things, all of them you can control. Um, and yeah, I think if you focus on one of them and you can tick those boxes, you've done your role perfectly. Um, and I try to do that coming off the bench. I'm curious how you see yourself within the framework of this roster. And I say it by way of, you know, you are 27, but you are in your second year. You have experience both here and internationally, but obviously in the WNBA more limited, this is a very young team, as you know, how do you strike that balance and in what ways do you try to lead? You know, specifically, I'm thinking of players like Grace Berger. Grace Berger has a lot of overlapping skill sets with what you have as well, but Grace is brand new to the lead. So how do you strike that balance? Yeah, oh, I, just, I try to just connect with them, like off court, try to connect and 
and just be, you know, a good teammate to to whoever it is. Um, you know, particularly Grace, mate, she's got so much talent. She's going to be the future of this program. So she's just someone that you just want to, you know, give confidence and encourage and, and you know, help when you can. But she's got it covered. So um, in terms of her, you know, she's she's got so much talent and potential. It's really just um, experience for her. Um, and that will come in, in, in time. It will really, it really will. Um, but, yeah, in terms of my role, I just want to be a good teammate to everyone and, and yes, we are young, and so we need to navigate, you know, how, how we kind of go about ourselves, it, it, more in terms of just our knowledge of the game. So we just need to continue to educate ourselves and spend more time in the film room um, and just learning to educate ourselves, I think. It's going to be fascinating to see how it all comes together. And we're going to talk a little more about it and also get into uh, Australia and overseas and just the way in which that all coalesces with the WNBA uh, seasons as well. Uh, but first, want to talk to you guys about today's sponsor, which is FanDuel. And FanDuel has a very interesting offer for the NFL football season, which is about to kick off. A chance to win, in fact, all season long. Now, let's say you decide a team is going to win the Super Bowl. You bet on that team to win the Super Bowl. Every time that team wins a regular season game, you're going to get bonus bets as well. So you pick, let's say, the New York Jets to win the Super Bowl. If, let's say you have a, a death wish. And so every time the Jets win, which would be like three or four times this year, you can use your bonus bets on spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. You go over, or you could pick a team that's likely to do it. So go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sports book. That's FanDuel.com slash L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N. And start earning those bets today. FanDuel.com slash locked on. So as we think about the Australian national team heading into the Olympics next year, first of all, I just I'm curious, are you a visualization person? And if so, have you let yourself think about what it would be like to be representing Australia at the Olympics in 2024? Yeah, definitely. I use all kinds of kind of methods to to keep me um, mentally prepared and ready. Um, mm -hmm. But this has been a goal since I was a young girl. Um, I would watch the Opals, the Australian Opals play on TV growing up um, and watching players like Erin Phillips, Christy Harrower, Lauren Jackson, Penny Taylor, all of the likes, um, you know, Jenny Screen, I, I would just – yeah, I was just in awe of them and just to see them and, and the culture that they build and just uh, the thing that really stood out was the, just that the, how tough they were. They were just tough women mm -hmm. and I knew I wanted to do that. And so to be in the position to potentially do that and potentially to make the Olympic team um, would just be a dream come true. Um, definitely Paris is the goal and, and I'm hoping that um, if all stars align that, you know, I can take that journey too. It seems to me like this is a team that just gets better by the year. You know, when I look at the amount of talent, the amount of depth, you know, the way in which the team is built, it feels like the ceiling just keeps getting higher. And I mean, you just you look up and down that roster and obviously there are plenty of WNBA stars on it. Does it feel like more of a challenge to make the team than ever before? And does it feel as if just related to that, like, you know, look, to lose, I think it was the quarterfinals, right, to the U.S. in the 2020 Olympics. But, you know, at some t at some points in Australia's history, that would have been, you know, a solid showing. Now it feels like, you know, well, that's an underperformance for what Australia can be. So just take me through kind of the way you think of that in both those frames, in terms of making the team and in terms of what this team can and should be. Mm, good point. I, I think, well, Australia, the Australian Opals have such a rich winning history, um, you know, particularly in the era I was just kind of mentioning, um, you know, we, we were expected to be top three yeah, uh, and to not hit that mark in, in the last few Olympic runs, um, yeah, I, I guess that's kind of not where we want to be and, and to be on the podium is our goal and to not hit that, yes, it's disappointing, but I think being able to go back to the drawing board and, and to work with Sandy and Olaf and, and Gar like all our assistant coaches um, 
to go back to the drawing board and and you know get our talent together. We we have so many um, players that play overseas, and it's hard because that's just the lifestyle of basketball and what we need to do as women and pros. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, we, we've tried to make more of an effort to bring the national team together and we tried to do that and that showed um, before the World Cup last year. So we had a few more camps than usual so that we could spend more time together. Um, and, and I think you're right in saying that we have so much talent. We have, we have a lot of players in the W um, at the moment, which is really exciting for Australian talent um, and our team. But, yeah, just, just in terms of just... Um, Spending more time together, I think that's a big thing for us. And we were able to do that before the World Cup and we had really great results. We got the bronze medal um, right. from that. Um, but, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited for the Opals. I'm excited for Paris, but I'm also excited for generations to come and, and, and the promising young talent that we've got lined up. Um, it's an exciting program to be a part of. I will just say I'm just going to flag it for our listeners, just so I can say I told you so sometime next year, when you see what (laughs) Essie has done, how she has developed, when you see that Rebecca Allen is now back and healthy, which I know everyone is delighted uh, to see as well. Steph Talbot is on the recovery rate. Uh, You know, we've been chronicling her recovery month by month over at thenexthoops.com. There's, it seems like it's lining up the way it should going into 2024. So I, I, I'm just going to, Say I told you so. And as far as Sandy and Olaf goes, um, you know, I think they're having a little bit of success this year on the coaching side, which is you know, a little bit, yeah, <laughs> just a little, just a little. They're doing, bit. So, they're doing so it, great. it does, it, it does all seem like it's going to come together. And then I, I, I just, just for you, like what you're saying about the expectation and to, to bronze in the World Cup, anything short of a medal feels like a disappointment to you when you think about what 2024 ought to be. Yeah, it's funny how, how we expect to have this, you know, the medal expectation on us. But I think that we're very capable of that. Um, and that's our goal. We want to be on the podium, um, obviously going for the gold medal. That that will that goal will never change. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, we, re- we really think that we, we can be on the podium um, at the Olympic Games. And um, that's where we want to be. So you talked about the development in the next generation ahead. And it's I'm always excited to talk to you about this because we got to talk WNBL, which uh, to my mind has seen such growth, such leaps and bounds just in the past few years. And the place, I guess, where it feels like it's most fortuitous, when you talk lining up again, is the way in which the season works so well with WNBA prioritization rules, right? So it doesn't mean that people have to choose in that way. And so first of all, the framework of it, right? At every turn, when we talk to players who are stateside, it's like, all right, WNBA is sort of center, and then there's a WNBA offseason, and you're thinking about it in those ways. Is it the opposite for you? Like, are you thinking in terms of WNBL first? Like, how do you kind of put it together, prioritization in your own mind? <laughs> there are no off seasons, is, is right. what I think. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I don't, I don't really, I don't really prioritize it like that. I just, I, I like to, yeah, it's a good question because I don't really prioritize it. I, I think both are just as equally as important as the next. I like playing in the w, WNBA for this re, these reasons and WNBL for these reasons. Um, but, yeah, in terms of hard work and, and how much I put into it, I put 100% into both. Um, sure. Absolutely. That's really funny. But, yeah, I, I love playing the, in the WNBL just mainly because it's home and I've got family and my people there. Um, I love the competition. I think it's one of the best um, in the world. Um, yeah, and, and to get to play at home is an absolute privilege. So I love that. But the WNBA has its other perks and benefits, and it's you're playing against the best players in the world, and you're getting better every day. So um, I like both um, and give everything <laughs> equally to both sides. And you, and you see that, obviously, in the numbers and the way in which you are a knockdown shooter, like I said doesn't matter where you are. Um, is that like if I woke you up at two o'clock in the morning, you would hit your threes, right? That would just be. I'd awesome. probably hit. I'd hit you first, and then you would, I'd, and then I'd try you, to hit. You three. would be right too. <laughs> <laughs> but I did notice also when you were in Melbourne last year that your rebound rate was by far the highest of your career, and and I wondered a couple of things. Number one, it's carried over here into Indiana, and we've seen that with a nice jump 
in your rebound rate here in uh, the WNBA in season two. How much of that is health? How much of that is a particular focus of what your coaches are asking you to do? You know, where did that development come within, you know, the overall scope of your game? That's kind of always been something I've tried to do is, is be a rebounding guard. Um, I think it always helps when you've got bigs that require a lot of attention, um, particularly here with um, Aaliyah Boston and, and Melissa Smith uh, and, and some of our other bigs. They just require a lot of attention and boxing out. So um, to be a sneaky guard and to slip a few rebounds in there is, is something that I can do. Um, so that always helps when you've got amazing bigs to play with. My guess is being 5'11 with a wingspan that you've got probably helps as well and being able to be a bit <laughs> But, you know, do, do you enjoy that? Do you? How much pleasure do you take from being able to um, post up against a, a smaller guard, a smaller defender when you get those? <laughs> I know typically you got you out on the perimeter, but I'm just wondering how much you enjoy that. That's right. Yeah, no, that's always fun. I, I rarely do it, but um... – that won't stop me from trying. I, I, my post moves aren't great, but um, I will try, no, without a doubt. <laughs> it won't be pretty. <laughs> no, I, but but it, it, it makes a lot of sense. And obviously, <laughs> seeing those skills and seeing them across the board, we're, we're delighted to see it. Um, be right back with just some final thoughts in just a moment. <clears throat> so, Christy, you talked about gratitude at the top of the show and obviously you know as as a basketball observer and journalist for a long time it's just it's delightful to see you get these opportunities but i'm wondering for you specifically when you've played this year what are like moments that have stood out and even if there's one where you just said you know well i feel particularly grateful to be here and experience what i am after having overcome so much Good question. I think there are all, there are so many little moments along the way. Um, the biggest moment that I've had since returning from all my injuries is uh, winning the bronze medal at the World Cup, um, playing for Australia, living my dream, um, playing with a great group of people that I just I love and adore, um, and to get a bronze medal and get be successful that was a really I think it's my favourite basketball moment that I've had is to win that bronze medal. Um, but but in terms of, of now being in America and, and getting my opportunities here, I, I, I'm just so grateful for everyone. And I just I mainly really just enjoy playing and being a part of a team. I think when you're injured for so long, it gets really isolating and lonely. Um, and to now just be with the team and get to see these girls every day and joke and laugh and, and just muck around, it's a pretty cool thing you know um and so those little moments of the day i'm just always really grateful for i will just end with the following point that whatever the numbers that we talked about you are number one in games played in the wnba this season at 31 and so seeing you back out there and healthy is something i think everybody can be excited about so Christy Wallace, continued luck and success. Delighted to see you always to our listeners thank you for making us your listen Every day, of course, the great Jackie Powell will be back with you tomorrow, getting you ready for the weekend. And until then, I am Howard McDowell, wishing all of you a wonderful Thursday. Ogumba Wallace for the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball.